Hi everyone, I wanted to do a bit of a different kind of reading vlog. I'm often asked what literary journals I'm subscribed to, buy, read, which ones I would recommend either to submit work to if you are a writer or just to read in general as a reader. And I realise I've become quite lazy in my consumption of journals. I I'm subscribed to Poetry London and the Rialto and those are my favourite poetry journals but I haven't really stepped outside of that zone for a while and seen what else is out there, what's new in the magazine scene, not just to do with poetry and short stories but just to do with journals in general. So I had a great time last week looking up other journals that I might want to subscribe to and what I've done is I've bought a few single issues of some journals and I'm going to talk to you about them in this video, read them uh, and tell you whether or not I would particularly recommend them. I was going to do I think about 10 but some of them haven't arrived so I'm going to split this into two parts. So we're going to be talking about five this time and then five another time. A journal that I bought recently um, a few months ago which I think I've mentioned in a haul before is Ache. This is a journal that's put together by the disabled and chronically ill people and I've already started this re reading this one and I'm really enjoying it but I'll talk to you about it in detail as this video progresses. Then I have my most recent copy of Poetry London. I love that they started doing these illustrated covers. They started doing that a few years ago. I think it's great. Poetry London was the first place that I was published in as a as a, as a grown-up, as an adult, um, and I have a soft spot for it. I also have the latest issue of Cunning Folk magazine. This one is one that I was sent because I'm one of the contributors in the water issue, so I'm going to be reading this new issue. I spoke about the first issue of this last Halloween because I think it came out around that time. So I say that I haven't been researching new journals. I have, just not as much as I used to. I think about 10 years ago, I was often at the South Bank Poetry Library and looking up loads of different journals, dozens, when I was submitting work to various places. Um, and because I don't do that as much anymore, I am out of the loop. So this was one of the ones that was on my radar anyway. Then I bought a copy of Flow, and this is different. This is not a literary journal, I don't think. I haven't read it before, so I don't really know. But I know that it is very beloved by people. I know that Kate and Nash, who run Much Ado Books in Alfriston, absolutely love this, and they've recommended this to me before. I think it's kind of a craft-based thing. It's how to spend your time doing fun things, cooking, crafting. And I know that at the end of this, they include lots of different paper and I think that there is an origami activity that you can do. And then I also bought Lunch Lady. So this is the final one that we're gonna be talking about in this vlog. And I do think that this is for young families. I think it is activities that you can do with your kids and I don't have kids yet, but as you can tell, I am a big kid at heart, so hopefully that's fine. Um, so in here there's craft activities, also food stuff. I think things to do with clothes. The reason that I bought this issue was because Rebecca's in it, Rebecca Tauzig, who um, is Sitting Pretty on Instagram and she's written a book called Sitting Pretty, which was one of my favorite books of last year. She is an amazing person and I love her dearly. So I wanted to support, not that they know that that's why I've bought this particular issue, but I'm throwing it out into the world. That's why I bought this issue and highlighting work by disabled creators is always fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that Rukmini Ayers in this who uh, wrote the roasting tin cookbooks. So yeah, anyway, I don't want to spoil it. I'm going to read through it properly. And also how tactile and beautiful is this? I love it. I also saw at the back, it's got some temporary tattoos in that Mr. M has his eye on. So maybe I will put some of these tattoos on him as well. So that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be wading my way through these. That sounds like I'm not excited. I'm going to be swimming through these. I'm going to be diving straight in. I'm looking forward to reading these. I'm going to report back on them and we're also going to do some cooking because you know that's what I like to do in my reading vlogs. So grab a cup of tea and join me. Hi, it is the next day. The weather is disgusting. <laughs> I do not believe that it is May. The weather has not got the memo about what time of year it is. It is gross. And today I'm going around to Lauren's. We organised this last week when the weather looked like it was going to be okay and it may be all right this afternoon but at the moment it is very nippy noodles and it is raining a lot um for me it's a two hour walk to get there because i'm avoiding getting the tube at the moment obviously 
Um, so two hours there, two hours back in the rain to then stand in her garden in the rain under an umbrella. But I haven't seen her since Edith was born, so it's totally worth it. I don't mind. I'm just gonna go stand under my umbrella like Eeyore or something. But um, I thought I would show you this. I thought it was really important. Obviously, I bought Edith books. She is only not even two months old, but I bought her some books naturally. That's my job, my job to buy people books. <laughs> Uh, but I thought it was also my job to buy her her first pair of dungarees. And how adorable are these? And I just wish that they did them in my side. In my side, my size. It's from a company called Tilly and Jasper, who I never bought stuff from before. But look at these, they're so cute. They've got bees on and ladybugs and grasshoppers. And I just, I just love them so much. I was gonna go over this morning, but it was torrential this morning. So I'm gonna go in like, an hour when hopefully it should be easing off. Um, anyway, going later means that I've actually managed to make some jam tarts, which I can take with me. So that's a win, isn't it? Anyway, I finished reading Ake magazine because we're here to talk about magazines, aren't we? We're not here to talk about dungarees, but we also know that we are here to talk about dungarees. I really, really like this and I'm so glad that it's a journal that I have discovered. I so appreciate the writers who have contributed to this and their honesty. So Lucia Osborne Crowley said, therapists say illness management should be communal. It should involve both partners. But as a woman, I had always known without ever being told that my ability to maintain a relationship depended on my keeping my suffering to myself. His burden, I always understood, was to be carried between us. Mine was to be carried alone. How? Ow, ow. Um, and I think my favorite piece in here is by Rosalind Rainers Gray, where she's talking about writing, reading, and reliving or living trauma. She says, there are times when the overwhelming desire to be heard and to be seen stumbles over and hurtles out when I am drunk or high and I tell friends or a group of people I barely know, often it is people I barely know, about something that has happened to me, something dangerous, something that caused an ongoing pain, a series of mental health problems, a pattern of destructive behaviors. I can recognize on these occasions that I am seeking some kind of acknowledgement of my suffering. At times, I am searching for shock in the faces of my audience. I want to verify that what happened to me was wrong. More than that, I want to challenge my belief that I am dramatic, oversensitive, an unworthy recipient of pain, an inadequate holder of the letters PTSD in my doctor's notes. And then they go on to talk about how it's difficult to write about trauma and medical trauma when all of that is wrapped up in shame. If we're told that writing about our experiences of disability or illness are somehow shameful or are a confession, then it perpetuates the strange vulture-like way of approaching memoir to do with disability instead of it being activism, which it is in its sense, it's just not viewed as that often by the outside. What's a person to do when their account of trauma or pain is configured as confession? When an experience is framed in the language of confession, it feels as though there is a necessary component of shame within the experience itself. And when this experience is one you have certain common commonalities with, shame seeps in through the page and under the skin. Another favorite of mine was Swimming Against the Nature Cure by Polly Aitken, which is talking about wild swimming and chronic illness. Um, I have definitely used YouTube as a means of therapy in the past that that urge to want to share vulnerable things but not sharing it elsewhere in my life. I definitely have done that before. Um, I try not to do that now. Um, I know that I do share things on this channel and I do talk about things, but I also talk about it elsewhere in my life too. There was a weird part of, a, a weird part of my life where it felt safer to share things on here than with like my family, which is a very, feels like a weird thing to admit actually and I'm not sure if maybe if you don't make content online that will sound really odd like even odder than it actually is but I think if you are someone who has been told not to talk about illness and disability to pretend that you're okay all of the time then 
it's not surprising that a lot of us turn to writing, is it, where we can explore that and talk about it either through metaphor or through memoir um, as a means to better understand ourselves, but hopefully encourage other people around us to understand us too. Advocacy as well is a way to to further that understanding, but feel like you've got more purpose than if you were just sharing your story as though that's not enough on its own. There are lots of things to unpack there and lots of things that I've been thinking about a lot recently um, and I have no answers, but I really loved the discussions that came up in Ake Magazine and yeah, I would very much recommend it. So I'm gonna go get the jam tarts out of the oven and then I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go into the rain. I was gonna say, please hope that the rain stops for me, but doesn't really work in retrospect, does it? But fingers crossed. <laughs> Good morning, my body is cross with me today. Walking that far and then sitting in the rain for two hours outside. My arthritis is not happy, but it was lovely to go and see Lauren and to see Edith through the kitchen door. <laughs> um, that was really lovely. And I didn't film any of it because it was raining, um, but here is a cute photo of Edith that Lauren posted on her Instagram. There is your, your baby. Phil, um, I need to crack on with work this morning, um, but my flat is a tip. I, I had a bit of a panic before leaving yesterday. It's all superficial mess, but it looks like a really disorganized drag queen's dressing room iteration in here right now. So let's do a speed clean of that in a second, you know, to be satisfying. But I did read Lunch Lady last night, and this, I am definitely not the target audience for this book. I think this would be so lovely for a family who have toddlers or primary school children. It's talking about sustainability and cooking and, and, and various different things, clothes, crafting, and as I said, it's got some lovely um, temporary tattoos at the back and a conversation with the person who designed like, and illustrated those things. The thing that I, not that I didn't like about this book, but that I, would have preferred to be different was that most of the features in here are interviews and it's all the same format so be you know tell us a bit about yourself how were you brought up as a child how are you bringing up your children and then there'd be a couple of questions specific to their particular interests so for Rukmini that would be talking about cooking and for Rebecca who as I said was in here Rebecca um about talking about disability I didn't really feel like the interviews were that deep, I suppose. Not to say that the responses weren't deep, but I, I didn't feel like the questions were that exciting. So I think I would have preferred reading features written by those people instead of interviews. But I did really enjoy the sections by Rukmini and Rebecca, but obviously I already knew their work anyway. But if you didn't, I think this would be a particular treat. I'm gonna think of who I know that I can pass this on to, who I think will, will love it more than me. Um, and I, I mean, again, it's just the most aesthetically pleasing magazine ever. It is so beautiful. I love that. It's great, but yeah. I don't have toddlers, so not exactly its target audience. Okay, let's do a speed clean, put these wigs away, tidy up a bit, and then I can uh, get on with my day. currently sitting on a pile of books on my new desk which I'm going to show you in a second 
Uh, category today is Gladriel redecorating her home. <laughs> um, I have finished reading Poetry London and I really loved reading this latest issue. It's actually Martha Spracklin's last issue. I'm sorry, let me mute that. It's Martha Spracklin's last issue editing it. Um, she used to work at Faber um, and I really love this collection that she has put together here and I've discovered some poets whose work I really want to check out. There is an erasure poem here of uh, an extract from the Ferguson Report which was really, really fascinating. I discovered a poet in translation who I did not know before called Lena Rodriguez Inglesias and there's a poem in here which is in both Spanish and English which she has translated herself called Frogs Everywhere that begins, the first animal I ever ate was a frog. It was between my breasts in need of assistance because it wanted to dance in the dark like a little dancer in the dark. Um, and there are a couple of her poems in here which I, I really enjoyed. There is um, an essay in here by Zoe Brigley which is talking about the possibilities of poetry over Zoom. There's another essay in here by Karani Baraka who's a disabled poet whose work I really love. And they're talking about the art of translating poetry. Uh, and I really love this poem by Topher Allen, which is about mermaid folklore and queerness. There's a lot of intersection between queerness and mermaid, I was going to say culture, mermaid stories, um, bodies in transition, I suppose, and bodies viewed differently. And there's a huge crossover between disability and mermaid culture too. Uh, and you can see both of those in the history of the fairy tale of the little mermaid and I've made a whole video about that which I'll link in the description box down below but anyway this is talking about the intersection of queerness and mermaid folklore and it's called gutted which is a which is a really really good title I actually wrote a poem about mermaid folklore and queerness called netted but this is called gutted in my country if a man wants a man he better want him underwater for wrong desire is to be a fish or fiction my fingers are fins and my jawbone could cut a man which is to say I am both but I'd rather just be fishbone, the type that stops at the throat and requires the sharp fact of scalpels to this lodge. I know a boy who became folklore at age 16, Dwayne Gully Queen Jones, as he blew kisses at men above sea level and the people turned his chest into a knife block. Such a good, good poem, such a varied uh, mixture of voices in here, people that I'd read before and people that I hadn't read before. In fact, if we're talking about mermaid and queer poetics, and uh, maybe I will read you my poem, Netted. I will grab it, two seconds. It's in my book, The Girl Aquarium, which is published by Blood Axe. And it's one of the, I opened it on the right page. It's one of the few poems in here that's written in Geordie dialect, which is the dialect of where I'm from in the North of England. And as I said, it's about mermaids and queerness or mermaid imagery and queerness, I should say. And it's called Netted. And then the court were I shouting like they was radio, me hair all up in their fists like a cloud. It's long now. Down to my navel, cause then all the black is like a cave what I can sit in, what I can sing in, with voices hiding in all the corners like I'm radio too. And then the court were, me and Caitlin, we was dancing our way, yem. Fairgrounds in what eyes, blazing out like dancing lions and me stomach is thinking jellyfish all zip zapping around. And then the court were, when we was whispering, and the fingers got me mouth, the hiccups of the ocean all dripping down with blouse, and the sounds was gunning manic like we was trapped underground. And then the court were, said we was danger, said our dark souls was a well, looking at us like we're fishes what swam but should have drowned, yet I think me soul's a lighthouse, and I cling to Caitlin's arm, our voices singing from all the corners like was mermaids in the dark. There we go. Um, I thought I would also show you, before I show you this desk, which I'm very excited about, um, book posts that I received today. So another one of the magazines that I'll talk about in the next instalment of this journal reading vlog style thing <laughs> is Lighthouse. So this is number 21. So that arrived today and this is their The Body Issue that I think I spoke about at the beginning of this video. Another zine that I ordered, this has come all the way from, is it from America? I feel like I ordered it from America. Apologies, I ordered it from Canada. This is Bed Zine, which is disabled and chronically ill people writing about bed. Uh, and it's got lots of 
artwork and stuff in here as well, which is very cool. I've been sent a proof copy of this little chapbook here, which is called Modern Medicine by Lucy Hurst. It says, Lucy Hurst's debut is a startling, bold and innovative chapbook. These poems explore experiences of illness, medicine and disability through visceral phrasing and mordant humour. I also received this, well actually two, uh, pre-orders that I had made. So this is I Want to Know That I Will Be Okay by Deirdre Sullivan. This is her first debut adult book. This is a collection of short stories. Um, it says a teenage girl tries to fit in at a party held in a haunted house with unexpected and disastrous consequences. A mother and daughter run a thriving online business selling antique dolls while their customers get more than what they bargained for. And after a stillbirth, a young woman discovers that there is something bizarre and wondrous growing inside her. And I also pre-ordered John Green's latest book. This is his debut non-fiction book called The Anthropocene Reviewed. Um, I used to really enjoy John Green's books. I think that they're not quite for me, his fiction books anymore. I am no longer their target audience, but... I'm always really fascinated by what he's got to say about the world. So, looking forward to reading this one. Okay, let me show you this desk that you are sat upon. Okay, welcome to my desk. This is not sponsored, but I was emailed last week from a company called Flexispot asking if they could send me a desk. Now, I have been freelance for full time for five years now five years but I have been working from home since graduating from uni a lot of the time which is the past 12 years and in all of that time I've never had a desk I have used um, a table that was in our bedroom so it was definitely the wrong height I just had a normal dining chair that I used to sit on which is you know fine and small doses but if you're working a lot from home, ergonomics are really important, especially when you have arthritis. So, given that I didn't have a desk, uh, I was very grateful to receive that email from Flexispot, and they have sent me this desk, and I will link them in the description box down below, the one that I have. Plus, I know that they are having a sale over the next few days, so you can go and check that out too. But I wanted to show you, I bought this, which I've spoken about in a video last year. So this is a kneeling chair. So it doesn't have a back, which you would think would be bad for your back, but actually I found it to be really great. I'll do a cutaway so you can see it properly, but basically you put your knees on the pad in front of you, but you don't put your weight on those and then your, your feet are on the floor. And this encourages you to sit up straight. So then I have the desk, and what is great about this desk is that it is a standing desk. Obviously I'm sitting right now, so you plug it into the wall because it's electric and then here on the side is a little panel where you can program the heights that you want it to be at so you can adjust it to any height you like but it can remember your standing and sitting heights pre-programmed and it can do that for two people in case two different people want to use it and there are which i found really helpful tables online that you can look at which tell you for um what height your chair should be at and what height your table should be at to do with the proportions of your body to make sure that you're, you know, being as good to your body as you possibly can. So this is it sitting, but then, let me press the button. It's like magic. Well, it's like electricity, I suppose. It's going up and then I can use the desk for standing instead. Um, so now I have all of my like, ergonomic setup and that's very exciting. So I just wanted to give this a shout out and thank Flexispot very much for gifting me this desk. As I said, it's not sponsored, but they did gift it to me and I wanted to tell you about it. I love it. Before I talk to you about the final two journals, I thought I would include some footage from the other day when I made flatbread pizza. I mentioned in a previous video that I've been experimenting with pizza dough um, recipes and really enjoying that. But if you want a good pizza dough base, you need to let it rise for a day. And sometimes, you know, you just crave pizza. You just wanna eat pizza within like an hour or so, right? Um, so that's when ordering in pizza is great, but if you wanna make your own, I thought, well, I might try some flatbread pizza. Um, so that's what I made the other day and it was so good. And the dough rises within an hour and then you cook it straight away. So um, it's definitely quicker than if you wanna make proper 
proper um, pizza dough from scratch. So I will insert that footage here. The flatbread recipe I actually posted as a reel on Instagram ages ago and I make them all the time, you know, to have with hummus or to make wraps with. So I'll link that recipe in the description box down below. And then for the toppings, you could make a proper um, tomato sauce like I would for the topping of a, a, an ordinary pizza. But because this only goes in the oven for five minutes, I decided to do a cheap, a cheap, a cheat, a cheap and cheat topping, which is a mixture of tomato puree, olive oil, salt and pepper and water, um, which I know doesn't sound great. The problem with making that topping is that you can't really taste test because it doesn't taste good until it's, until it's cooked. But the topping is basically four parts tomato puree to one part garlic, salt and pepper and a splash of water, mix that together. Um, then I added some mozzarella, um, I think I added some anchovies to these ones, but normally I just make it just with mozzarella. And then I do a garlic dip on the side, which is about four parts mayonnaise to one part garlic and two parts water with some dried oregano in it. And that, that dip ah, is like the, you know, Domino's garlic drip of, drip, drip the garlic dip of dreams. Um, so yeah, I made the flatbreads as per the recipe below did the toppings and then put them in the oven for five minutes on 200 degrees and they were so, so good. Highly recommend and you can play around with all the toppings, of course. So I'll insert that here and then I'll come back to you and talk to you about the final two literary journals. I don't know if you can hear how windy it is outside, but it's so windy. Okay, let me talk to you about the final two journals. So, Flow, as I said at the beginning, is not a literary journal. So it's thought pieces on various things that are going on in the world. Um, and it is so beautifully put together. Definitely like Lunch Lady in that respect. The quality of the design is amazing. The illustrations that they have commissioned for each issue are wonderful. 
But I think that what I'm realizing doing this video, and again, I love the artwork with the, the masks on the photographs. What I'm realizing doing this video is that I definitely prefer literary journals or um, perhaps just very specific journals. So Ache is disabled and chronically ill, uh, people writing, Cunning Folk, which I'll talk about in a minute, is about the occult and it's all poetry and short stories. Poetry London is obviously all poetry, including poetry reviews and some essays. Um, whereas Flow and Lunch Lady are trying to appeal to as many people as possible. And I don't find that that is working for me very much because I, I I just don't feel as though it is detailed enough or specific enough for my for my tastes. I think this is definitely a pick this up over a cup of tea, have in most cases quite a light read going in. So there is uh, an Italian writer in here who is talking about Italy in lockdown um, and talking about how eerie that was. Sorry, my camera cut out because my card memory was full. Basically, I was talking a lot there. Let me focus you. Um, in short, and I'm not really sure how to summarise this, but I'm getting increasingly frustrated with space that's given to um, not necessarily non-disabled people talking about the pandemic, because obviously non-disabled people can and should talk about the pandemic. But I mean that narrative of this is so unusual, our health is threatened, um, this was so scary, but times are getting better and things are opening up and now everything's fine. Um, it feels like the erasure of voices where health is always a prominent thing and I wish we were given more space to talk about that. And obviously there are places like Ape Magazine and Sick where disabled writers are talking about that, but I mean in the mainstream. At the same time, I also appreciate that Flo is trying to speak to... Um, I suppose as many universal experiences as possible and I think that many people think that disabled voices are much more of a minority than they actually are or that they have less appeal and people don't want to listen to them which you know may well be true but I also think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy anyway I feel like I went off on a bit of a tangent there in short flow is beautiful uh, I mean look 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 how beautiful it is um but I think I want more more grit. I don't really know if that's the right word. Anyway, in short, I think this is really good. I just don't think it's what I particularly look for in a journal now thinking about it more critically. Um, but I am now reading Cunning Folk, um, which I haven't finished, but I will finish and talk about in my wrap up. But I am so enjoying it. Also, it smells so good. It smells so good. So this is their water issue. So it is very specific. It's looking at occult things and folklore to do with witchcraft. Naomi Ishiguro has a short story in here, which is called The Woman in the Pond. And I really like this folklore twist on a wicked stepmother. Um, it's about a, a stepdaughter who really doesn't like her stepmother and finds a woman swimming in a pond and asks her to help her save her. But, you know, really, it's the stepmother that needs to be saved. The stuff on here in tarot to do with water. There are some recipes um, for foraging. So there's a wild garlic pesto recipe in here. The stuff on water deities, which I think is really cool. Um, so lots of great stuff in here that I haven't yet read. And again, so beautifully put together. Lots of amazing photographs and illustrations. It's fully illustrated. Um, and I have a poem at the back here which is called The Anatomy of the Sea. So let me read that to you. That is after Hyun Suk's seaweed soup recipe. Exciting. So this is The Anatomy of the Sea and um, they got Marie Braden to illustrate it, which is really cool. So the subheading says, after the nuclear disaster of Chernobyl in April, 1986, radioactive rain fell across Europe. In the following three years in the northeast of England, there were hundreds of extra cases of children born with limb differences. I was born in January 1987 in Sunderland with Etridactyly. The rain falls in northern England and still the women dig deeper for their children. They rip fingertips below the greenhouses, bellow into the soil and marvel at the wet, wet earth so much like the sea of which they are afraid. Not Mother Earth, not the bearer or the ark, nor the trees. No, they search the soil for seeds and they are thankful they are grateful. It's only after that my mother is grave. 
Nine months later, I am clawed from the sea. A river child, a lobster baby. Oh, they say. Oh, all fingers and thumbs, my blanket petrichor, and we drown in genetics. Late at night, my friends and I are watching the hills have eyes and I know that I am the only body horrified. They dare each other to run outside, but I stay put, my meat heart pounding. Monster, monster, monstrous. In an Airbnb in Copenhagen, my husband and I watch the TV show Chernobyl. Jared Harris and Emily Watson are saving the world, but its people are burning and I have rage, the likes of which you would not believe. The April before I arrived, men were godlike in their mistakes, obsessed with their creations. Now my hands are birds, elephant, rock salt, constellations, an enemy. Listen to me. Until the 1800s, anyone with a disfigurement was medically called a monster. Somewhere, I am certain, Mary Shelley stands on a mountaintop commanding the clouds. It has stormed for weeks, and she is lost for words, haunted by images of a jigsawed man. We all look skywards, seawards, see the tumbling birds, feel the damp soil inking into our feet. This is where we were meant to meet. We mother hunt for hours in the flesh of the earth. We plant ourselves firmly and cross our numbered digits. Then, oh then, we summon the rain. There you go. If you would like to check out this, I will link this and all of the other journals that I have mentioned in the description box down below. I will also list my books in the description box down below. If you're new and you haven't checked those out before, I've written books for both adults and children. Uh, the ones that you may particularly be interested in are The Beginning of the World in the Middle of the Night, which is my short story collection, and The Girl Aquarium, which is a poetry collection. I hope that you have enjoyed um, this video. I certainly have enjoyed branching out and reading other things, even though they didn't particularly work out for me. I loved reading Ache um, and Cunning Folk and also Poetry London and I look forward to talking to you about five more journals in another reading vlog very soon. If you have any journal recommendations let me know in a comment down below. I hope you're all having a good week and I'll speak to you soon. Sending lots of love. Bye!